Hey, it's Bible Scribe again. Thanks for joining me. This is another in my series on imminent time statements and preteristic statements in the New Testament books. This book being 1 Peter that we're going to go through in just a second. And so the reason I'm doing this series to reiterate is that you know non-preterists don't recognize these, these statements as preteristic, as historical statements about the feeling and perspective of the people that were Christians in the first century before 70 AD. And so going through these books of the New Testament and establishing, recognizing these time statements is a major step for people that aren't familiar with it. And hopefully by going through here, some people will open their eyes to the reality of what the people in that time frame thought and what Jesus taught and what the apostles taught about when he was coming back and that it was going to happen in their lives. And their statements reflect that. So we are going to go through that and we're going to do it in the book of 1 Peter. Let me pull the slides up. So imminent time statements and support for their preterist position in 1 Peter. First, in the first chapter, we have verses 3 through 7, which say, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again into a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith into salvation. Catch this now. This is the statement. Ready to be revealed in the last time. So it's ready to happen. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than the gold that perish, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. So, oh, those two statements, being revealed in the last time, and the uh, your... Um, trial through fire, be found unto praise at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Statements saying that these things were being expected. Uh, in the last time, that statement meaning that they were thinking they were in the last time, and that was around 65 AD when they were reading or getting this message from St. Peter. So if the last time was 2,000 years away from them, why would they have made statements like this? It doesn't make any sense. You wouldn't talk to someone about their, uh, you know, hard work through these trials and tribulations they were going to go through and patience being rewarded at Jesus Christ appearing if that was something so far in the future, past your death, 2,000 years, that it really had an, almost no relevance to you. And it wouldn't have had any relevance to them if that was what had been said, but it wasn't. They were talking about this trial of their faith that was about to be found at the appearing of Jesus Christ, which they were expecting. In 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 10, it says this, Of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently, who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. So he's talking about the salvation and grace that had come to these Christians was what was prophesied by the prophets. And so the statement we can make is that those prophets were prophesying of this occurrence in 65 AD, in the first century. And if that's true, then this links these Christians in the first century and salvation, their salvation with the Old Testament prophets. And in by turn, that links them with all the end times prophecies as well. So if we start making these connections, which are natural in the text, uh, that the prophets were prophesying about this generation of Christians in the first century, then it starts to link up and we realize that the prophets were talking about this time frame and calling it the last days and calling it the end of the age. So the meaning of those phrases, last days, end of age, was that time period ending in 70 A.D. The next verse is, is chapter 1, verse 13. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace 
that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So it's saying, hope to the end for the revelation of Jesus Christ to these people in 65 AD. Persevere, hope till the end, because it's coming, is what they were saying. If this revelation of Christ was not going to be for 2,000 years, then this wouldn't have meant a single thing to these Christians. They would have been like, I, you know, okay, great, but I'll go about my business because that's not for 2,000 years. I'll be long dead and gone. So will my children and my children's children. But that's not true. The revelation of Christ was something that Peter and all these Christians, the apostles, Christ taught and they expected to see in their lives. 1 Peter 1, verses 19 and 20, But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you. So he's speaking to these Christians in 65 AD and saying this is a part of what we called, and the prophets called, the last times. So they were in it, and it was going to be fulfilled in their lifetimes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. Wherefore also is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believes on him should not be confounded. Well, this uh, actually is straight out of the book of Isaiah, chapter 28, 16, which says, So this is what the Lord God says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a tested stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation, the one who believes will never be shaken. Obviously, that was quoted word for word in 1 Peter, but the context of Isaiah 28, which was written in 17, 715 BC, 715 years before Christ, is that the judgment would be coming on Israel, and it was talking about the first century, what happened in the first century. It, it was If you read through chapter 28 of Israel, you'll see the judgment coming upon them and it was after God laid this cornerstone. We know the cornerstone of Zion was Christ, was Jesus Christ. Whoever believes on him will not be shaken. So the judgments were supposed to come after that according to the prophecy. And if that is true, then we are talking about those things occurring in the first century after Christ rose from the dead in 70 AD. He came in power and in glory. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 through 10 but ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of the darkness into his marvelous light, which in past, in time past, were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but have now obtained mercy. So uh, also this is echoed in Romans 9.25. He says also in Hosea, I will call them my people, which were not my people. And this is a spot where Paul is talking about the Gentiles being considered a part of the family of God. Uh, a people which were not a people, but are now going to be called a people. And this cross references in Hosea chapter 2, verse 23, which says those exact words. But Recognize the context of Hosea chapter 2, verse 14 through 23, is about God restoring Israel and betrothing her as a wife, but also making Gentiles his people. All this occurred in the first century. Uh, Christian Jews were a part of his kingdom. Christians that were Gentiles became a part of his kingdom. These Christians of the first century being the first fruits of God's kingdom in heaven. And, um, you know, just note that, that statement about in Hosea of, of God betrothing Israel. Israel was his bride, and that is reiterated in the book of Revelation as well, that that would occur. And this is all prophecy that was fulfilled in the first century. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. Again, this day of visitation was what they were constantly expecting in the first century, and this was the visitation of Christ, his second coming. They expected those that they witnessed to in the surrounding Gentile areas 
to be alive at Christ's coming, because the statement is made, we want them to behold and glorify God when he comes again in his day of visitation. Glorify Christ. So it, um, it's very clear, it's very clear when you read these statements, what they were thinking, what they expected to happen, and what did happen in the first century, A.D. 70. Chapter 3, verse 22, Who has gone into heaven, meaning Jesus, and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject unto him. So they, these people, these Christians, and Peter saw Christ as being holy on and had assumed his throne, the throne of David, at God's right hand in heaven at that time. So after Jesus Christ resurrected and went to heaven, after spending 40 days with the disciples, then uh, he sat at Christ, God's right hand on his throne in heaven. It's the throne of David mentioned in the Old Testament. And in Acts chapter 2. 4 verse 7 says, But the end of all things is at hand. Be ye therefore sober and watch unto prayer. So, the end of all things. That statement is a prophetic statement. The last days, the end of the age. Did the whole world end? No, the whole world did not end. Did the old covenant end? Yes, the old covenant was done away with. The temple was destroyed. Sacrifices had stopped long before the temple was destroyed even. Did the wickedness of the Jews end? Yes, the wicked Jews were destroyed in Jerusalem. Did the old age pass away? Yes, the old age did. Did a new age begin? Yes, it did. A new aeon or age in the Greek. 1 Peter 4, 12-13 Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you, as though some strange thing happened unto you. But rejoice, inasmuch as ye are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. Now, they, as Christians in the first century, all the Christians in the first century who listened to the apostles and Christ were expecting to go through tribulation. And in the years 67 through 70 AD, when the city of Jerusalem was under siege, that tribulation came to pass. The Jews in the city were under siege, so they couldn't even get food in and out of the city. It got very scary in the city. People were starving. People were resorting to cannibalism or other tactics to find food and get what they needed to survive. Uh, the people here are fully expecting Jesus to return in his glory. When his glory shall be revealed, it says. That was the return they were expecting. And it occurred in the clouds in A.D. 70. Jesus came back in the clouds. 1 Peter 4.17 For the time is come that judgment must begin at the house of God. Now, judgment is saying must begin at the house of God, and that was the temple in the first century. It was called Herod's temple. Uh, the temple was then destroyed in 70 AD, like we had said before, when Christ came in the clouds, the judgment was passed, the temple was destroyed at that time. The Romans destroyed it. All the priests were at this time burned alive inside the temple. If you read Josephus, his book, The Wars of the Jews, then you will read about this. But the priests and a ton of Jews scurried inside the temple to escape the Romans and seek shelter and pray to God for help. Of course, their time was past for that. This was now a time of judgment, so God did not save them from this. Uh, and those Jews and the priests were burned alive in the temple and slaughtered. Most of the Jews in Jerusalem were slaughtered altogether by the Roman soldiers as they went through the city. So, a horrible time, but this is the time that is being spoken of in 1 Peter 4.17, the time of judgment for the house of God, the temple. 1 Peter 5.4, And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So they fully expected to see Christ appear and be alive at that time. Uh, they were expecting it when the chief shepherd shall appear. They were looking for this. So that's it. That's the imminent time statements in the book of First Peter. I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, there were a lot in, in the book of First Peter. Um, 
but we're going to keep doing this and going through these different books and seeing all these time-based statements and inferences and related things to the judgment that came upon Israel in AD 70 and the first century fulfillment of Old Testament prophecy and the prophecies of Christ in the Olivet Discourse. And we're seeing now that throughout all the New Testament books, this was very eminent for these people. They were looking for it in their lives, and it did come in their lives if we look at history and what happened. And these videos, I'm doing these videos so that uh, it's, it's laid out there for you to see, for people to see, and come to the realization that it's different possibly than you may have grown up with. Just like me, I grew up with different teaching than this. It was not taught to me this way. Uh, there was a lot of doctrine and dogma taught, but it was not straight from the scriptures, which is what we are doing. We're going and looking at these scriptures with the eyes of the people who received these letters. And it is eye-opening to do that. Thank you for joining me. I, I sure appreciate you. I pray that God blesses you and that these videos uh, you know, help people see the truth of what God has done in history and um, how spectacular it was. Like and subscribe if you got something good out of the videos, and just uh, stay tuned to my channel. I'm going to keep going through these books and releasing more of these videos on preteristic statements in the New Testament books. God bless. Have a good night.